Actually, the virtual participants to shout the question on you. On do you prefer to have them at the end of the talk? Uh, better to have it during the talk. Okay. Okay. So I guess that you uh, heard that our virtual participants. So in case you want to ask, just unmute yourself and shout. And it's the same for you here in the room, I guess. Yay. When, is, when do I have to be done? Yes. Yeah. Just to maximize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So, first off, really want to thank Marie and Renault for putting this together. This is a really cool opportunity to come together and do something we haven't really been able to do for a very long time, unfortunately, which is make new friends and learn together, uh, share new ideas. This is a very, uh, very cool opportunity. I'm very happy to be here and especially to have uh, this sort of kickoff talk about, about positioning with telemetry. My name is Robert. Uh, I work in Norway at the Norwegian Institute for Nature Research and at the Norwegian Research Center. Uh, and the talk today is, is going to be uh, everything that I know about how to position animals underwater, which is uh, more every day, thanks to a lot of the people here that I continue to learn from. Uh, and it's, uh, I'm going to talk very fast at times, so uh, if, I will look to the audience for a bit of feedback. If I'm going too quickly, I will try to slow down, so don't be shy to give it like a, you know, slow down kind of symbol. Maybe not that, that's very negative, but, uh, but yeah, so just give me a bit of feedback during this because I tend, I tend to get going a little bit quickly. Uh, and I'll take questions absolutely throughout. Uh, if you're lost, if you want something to be repeated or clarified, uh, please uh, speak up, ask a question. I want everybody to be able to, to learn as much as possible from this. That's what this is about. Uh, and uh, we'll get through uh, all of it either way. So uh, I work with a big team in Norway. We do a lot of telemetry stuff. We work with radio telemetry, a lot of acoustic telemetry, some positioning telemetry. Uh, some of our team members are here today, some online. Uh, but a lot, of, a lot of what I've learned and what I continue to learn is uh, is thanks in large part to a lot of these people. So this is my talk kind of about uh, about what we've learned collectively as a group. And uh, again, just uh, my, my affiliations with Norris and Nina. Uh, I work a lot with the European Tracking Network as well as Ocean Tracking Network from Canada. Uh, and, and a lot of, of our work is funded by the Research Council of Norway. So acknowledging their, their support for a lot of the work that we've done. And I think a really important thing to understand about animal movement and something that, that took me a long time to grasp is uh, is, is the way that it, it's very tortuous. It, animals move in, in very complex patterns, and it's very similar to something called the coastline paradox, where it's actually very difficult to measure a coastline because it depends upon the scale at which you actually measure the coast. So, uh, depending on the, the the resolution that you're able to to have, you can measure totally different coastlines. And uh, a, a fact that I like living in Norway is that, that depending on how you measure it, the uh, the, the coastline of Norway is larger than the coastline of all of Australia. Uh, but it, it, it depends very much on how finely you measure the coastline because you can measure it at many different scales. And, and that really makes animal movement a fractal. Uh, and a fractal is, is a mathematical pattern, it's a geometric pattern. You may have played with kaleidoscopes as children, maybe as adults as well. You look through them and the fractals sort of move through space. There's a, there's a lot of math behind fractals, but, but the, the principles of a fractal is that you really uh, you, you develop these patterns based on mathematical equations, and, and the uh, the outline, the boundaries of the fractal really depend on how you measure them. So, so here we have sort of a a track of an animal moving through space, and uh, and it's generalized at, uh, at at certain time points. So, so this is a a track every one hour, and and in between these tracks, they may be moving a lot in between. But the the resolution that we have is one hour, and that's and that's what we get. The, the more finely we measure movement, the more frequently we measure movement, the uh, the more different the actual tracks and the and the actual information that we that we gather from these animals becomes, and and that is the the heart of positioning, especially underwater, because uh, a lot of what we do really depends on the resolution and the and the kinds of data that we have. And it's really important to think about, especially as we design studies and analyze data that uh, we we almost never really truly know exactly what the animals were doing. We only know what they were doing at some uh, some sort of subsampled time scale. 
And so the, this is a really interesting paper about fractals and the geometry of nature. Uh, there's a variety of really interesting papers by uh, and books by Turchin about uh, about fractals and, and animal movements. And, uh, and there's there's a variety of debate among mathematicians about whether animal movement is actually a fractal or not, and, and on and on. But uh, it's just a, an interesting concept to sort of start start off with. So tracking animals underwater, it's very difficult, of course. I mean. We're, we all struggle with it. We all are trying to learn more about it. Uh, it makes it fun and exciting to be doing some one of the most difficult things on the planet in some ways. Uh, and, and, and a lot of what we know about movement is developed thanks to Rand Nathan and his 2008 paper in Precisions in uh, PNAS. Uh, and, and this excellent framework on, on animal movement showing that uh, there's external factors, the internal state of the individual, uh, the motion capacity. So, uh, physiological and physical capacities to move, navigation capacity, so ability to perceive the environment and move through it, uh, and, and, and all of those things integrate to the movement path, which is what we measure. And, and of course, we can do experiments, we can, do, uh, we can make observations to try to disentangle how these factors are affecting the movement path. But, but with most telemetry devices, what we're really trying to understand is the movement path. So, so in theory, you could you could tag an animal at birth, and it may be a neonatal uh, deer or, or a small fish, and you can track it through its whole life, looking moving through the habitat uh, all the way to death. And then you can you can really see how it's moved, how it's used habitat, how it's moved through its environment, how it's interacted with other individuals, and uh, and and as a fractal, again, you can you can potentially, depending on your sampling resolution, zoom in on these tracks and see different behaviors emerging at really fine scale. So. Uh, within an hour, you can see, okay, it's searching for food, and then it travels to a different patch, it esca escapes predator, goes to a new patch, and starts feeding again. You can overlay all sorts of habitat data, uh, all sorts of environmental information on this to understand movement. Uh, studying fish and other aquatic animals is, is not really so simple. On land, global positioning systems, of course, can connect to satellites. You can get uh, fixed positions for, uh, for individuals over time. Uh, we don't really we don't have that luxury for most aquatic animals. You may be, may have fast lock GPS, but uh, for the most part, we need to use different tools. So there's there's light based geolocation that is very popular. A lot of people refer to this as satellite tag. Uh, it's not really a satellite tag. It just transmits the the, the logged data to satellites uh, later on. Uh, but this is just based on the principle that uh, sunrise and sunset times uh, could be predictable in some ways in different parts of the planet. And then you can estimate where the tag must be, where the animal must be uh, on the planet based on the, the light data that, that are derived. So this is a paper by Alex Belus, uh, which was published in IC's Journal of Marine Science. And it's looking at these species of yellowfin tuna, uh, blue marlin, and sailfish. And he had uh, positions for twice a day, so sunrise and sunset for all these animals. And you can see it's just one, one or two positions a day, depending on, on where the animal is. If it's too deep, you can't get the position, or you can't estimate the position. Uh, there's a lot of error in these. So, so, so the scale at which we actually want to understand movement really matters as well. The, the animal may not have actually been exactly here. It was probably within the 10, 50 kilometer radius. But, uh, but given the scale of the ocean, it, it's really good enough to know that it was there. And, uh, and several tracks per day uh, provide us uh, different different behaviors here. So range restricted behavior, movement, and 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 this is this is very generally coarse data, but it's on a scale in the ocean that allows us to make inferences about behavior, inferences about how they're using their their habitats. So this this boundary here, the, the red polygon, is is Palau, uh, and it's the exclusive economic zone of Palau. And and the study was really trying to understand how. How much site fidelity do these animals have within the the EEZ and the exclusive economic zone of Palau? And you can see that the different species tend to have different uh, different affinities for that for that area. The acoustic telemetry we're working on much smaller scales. We're not interested in the whole ocean basin very frequently. Of course, we put acoustic tags on large pelagic animals, but oftentimes we're working in more range restricted areas, uh, estuaries, embayments, lakes. Uh, and, and this is the paper that we published uh, in Movement Ecology last year, uh, showing some of the ways that acoustic telemetry can be used to really develop different different kinds of data. So raw positions from two animals. This is a, a lake in Czechia that, uh, that that Maria has worked in as well. And you can see we have raw positions for these two different uh, individuals. You can calculate home range from that and, and look at the 95% the utilization distributions. You can look at trajectories. You can calculate step lengths and turning angles. 
looking at, looking at activity levels, so, so change in position over time, how, how quickly they're moving. Uh, you can look at the temperature usage, uh, the three-dimensional habitat, you know, all sorts of things with acoustic telemetry uh, if you have these positions. And, and, the, and there's a couple of different ways that you can uh, derive uh, information from acoustic telemetry data, data, and that depends on how you design your array and depends on how you uh, design your study. So detection data is, is the most simple form of acoustic telemetry data. This is simply uh, presence, absence on our, on our receiver. So acoustic, uh, acoustic listening stations uh, such as this. This is, a, this is Lena, one of our, our colleagues. She's setting up this radio antenna to, to be a listening station. We often use acoustic listening stations uh, as well. And, and we just want to know, okay, was the individual detected here? Was it not? And over time, we can develop a time series of detection data. So Kim Wariski wrote a, a really nice review of the uh, te techniques for analyzing aquatic telemetry data uh, with detections. So spatially discrete de detections, those are not overlapping, those are not precise positions. Uh, so it's, it's, it's when and where are the tags detected uh, and what do movements between fixed receivers look like. And, uh, and we don't know the positions of the animals typically. And, but that all depends really on the scale at which we're conducting this. If, you're, if you have a, a, a grid in an entire Great Lake or, or a large bay, it may be that detection on a receiver and, and the range of that receiver is sufficient to, uh, to act as a position the same way that light-based light geolocation is being used as a position. It's not an accurate position necessarily, but if you're okay with the sampling resolution, it can, it can act as a pseudo position in a way. And so we can draw these networks, another paper by, by Alex Belus, a good friend of mine, we've worked together a lot, and, and he's back to the back to Palau studying yellowfin tuna and trying to understand how these buoys, so these are uh, fish aggregating devices, uh, how they're working to, to aggregate uh, tuna. So they're trying to look at sustainability of fisheries in Palau and trying to understand, okay, are there, are there high performing buoys? Uh, can, we, can we reduce the fuel consumption of, uh, of fishers by having more effective buoys in, in, in a, uh, more effect, efficient places? And, and simply by drawing lines between these buoys that had receivers, uh, he was able to, to, to infer the, the movement patterns uh, and the site fidelity uh, of these yellowfin tuna. And from Kim's paper on uh, acoustic uh, analyzing detection data, uh, she looked at bull trout data in the Kim Basket Reservoir in Canada uh, and saw that, you could, that there were some central places in the network. So oftentimes, <laughs> We look at really large detection files with, with millions of detections, uh, and we could crunch that down and just say, okay, network analysis, this can hold a lot of complex data. We're going to throw out a lot of the, the spatial and temporal dependency uh, and just draw lines in between the receivers, look at the edge weights, uh, and make summary statistics. And, and, and this, this, this car salesman summarizes that quite well. And in Florida, they've done a lot of this work with, uh, with, with network analysis. They have a lot of receivers uh, in the Florida Keys, and they're looking at tons of different species of so bluefin tuna, lemon sharks, white sharks, hammerheads, amberjacks, and they're looking at all these different detection patterns. Uh, and, and the limitations of this method become clear very quickly that, uh, you know, this is not really an accurate representation of how uh, a white shark or uh, certainly a bluefin tuna is using this area. It's probably uh, way up here, but we just don't have receivers there, so we don't know what's there. We just have the network. We just are able to determine presence, absence, where we have receivers. And it's a very important consideration when trying to conduct studies like this, where you want to know about presence, absence, to ensure that you, you're placing receivers and putting infrastructure in both areas that you expect to see individuals and areas where you may not expect it. Because if you only place receivers where you expect to see individuals, your networks would be quite biased. and You don't learn nearly as much about uh, about absence, which is really valuable data as well. And, and networks typically work well. So, so this is in Florida. This is an LED Lede study. Uh, look at comparing kernel density methods, which I'll talk about in a minute, to, to networks. It's a very classic paper. You can see that the way that they've designed their array, though, so, uh, you see that they have this, this grid design uh, that's separated a little bit. And so it, it, it's a very uh, it's a very comprehensive way of conducting a network analysis. And, and, and she found that uh, the metrics that, that calculated from the network analysis, the summary statistics of the network, uh, give similar spatial information about where the individuals were using most of their time to these kernel density, density home range estimators that are very popular. And so we can go from networks to positions. So networks, again, are simply 
drawing lines in between re receivers. And positions are, are starting to try to actually derive, okay, more, more information about where the individuals are between or among receivers, not just detections on receivers, but okay, if, we, if, if, you're, if you're between multiple receivers, where exactly are you? And this is a figure that I drew once upon a time, my own two hands, I'm very proud of it. You can see, uh, you can see, we started to estimate, okay, how are they moving in this space? And a position I define here as a location in two or three dimensional space at a given time. And that is more than simply a detection on a receiver or a station. So we have imprecise positioning, where we don't actually really know exactly where the individual is, but we're trying to estimate it using the tools that we have available. Uh, so again, it's, it's more than just movements in between receivers, it's, it's actually positions in space uh, within, a, within an area. And it allow, the imprecise positioning allows calculation of autocorrelated movements. It's really not a path, but it, it's closer to a path than what we get with a network analysis and just simply detection data. Uh, and this is common to use for home range, uh, core area, resource selection with acoustic telemetry, uh, and that there are, of course, limitations to this. Uh, but you really have to ensure that you have good coverage of the area that you're studying in order to get good estimates. So just quick check in. Is everybody on board with this so far? Difference between networks uh, and, and positions and paths? Okay, we'll keep, keep on motoring then because I still have a long way to go. So, so centers of activity is a very common metric of imprecise positioning. I see it more and more in the literature. It was originally sort of uh, estimated by Colin Simpendorfer in the 2002 paper, thinking about, okay, can we, can we crunch down a lot of detection data into an average position within a grid? And the Simpendorfer paper, paper really suggests that you should have overlapping detection ranges. So uh, you should be able to, if you want to calculate a center of activity, you can't do it uh, very effectively uh, across broad spaces and, and uh, uh, an unequal uh, sampling uh, array design. So we have, we have a small grid here in a lake. Uh, this is one of the lakes we work in in Norway. And we have smolts, so juvenile salmon, they're moving into the lake here, moving th through the array. And I'm just demonstrating how the centers of activity in, uh, among these, re these receivers perform. So you can see some of them are on land, it's not so good. Uh, we don't. We can't really calculate any averages that are outside of our uh, our receiver grid, so that's not great. And and you can see that this this purple individual. So this is the month of April, month of May. This purple individual is probably dead. A lot of the smalls that we have die in this, these lakes uh, because it's just pinging all these receivers. And this is a five minute average. So the center of activity. There, there's a lot of action on uh, on the. Health, health pages and, and people that want to calculate centers of activity because they work well with packages like VTRAC that are sort of standard analysis tools. And, and one of the most common questions is, how do I calculate centers of activity? It's very easy. You simply uh, uh, bin time into, into uh, desirable units, so five minutes, 10 minutes, one hour, and then calculate the mean longitude and the mean latitude, and that's your center of activity. So this is every five minutes, you get an average of of the longitude and latitude, which is weighted by the number of receivers it's detected on, then it gives you a point. Was the animal ever there? Probably not. Is that a real position? Uh, almost certainly not. Uh, if it is, it's only by chance, but it gives you an idea of within a grid where where may it have been. And, uh, and, and these are used very commonly uh, now more and more. So uh, short-term centers of activity are integrated into a variety of packages. Uh, people like, people love to draw home ranges, uh, home, there's tons of home range studies saying this is what the home range of this animal is. Well, that, that really depends. It's bull shark, I'm pretty sure. Uh, is it likely that the home range is actually accurately captured by this polygon? I would say almost certainly not because there, there's no coverage really offshore here and, and the, the home range of the animal may actually be more like this. But all we can say about the home range using these methods is that the home range within the receiver area. So it's important to think very carefully about what the home range is actually calculating when you don't have full coverage and you don't have precise positions. Uh, but they are very common and they can be useful and, and, and a, a compelling argument is they're very good communication tools. People understand them. People, uh, managers and, and communities, they really like to see uh, your big blobs and, and uh, uh, 
and polygons around the areas and say, okay, the, the, this is where the bull sharks are. And mostly 95% of the time, this is where the bull sharks are. People are happy with that. They like them, but we need to think about one, the biases of what that actually uh, is telling us about the animals. Uh, and also going into a study, if that's a, if that's a metric we want to calculate, we need to think very carefully about how the, the array is designed so that, again, we're not just uh, looking for presences, but we're also uh, looking for absences so that so that we can we can know where the where the animals are, but also where they are not, and and and, the, and surprisingly, it's not so common, but it's a very important consideration. And, and the interval for uh, centers of activity uh, really depends on the, the the sampling scale that you have. Uh, I often use 15 minutes, sometimes five minutes, uh, but I, I in general I I don't use centers of activity that much. So it's, yeah, it's not a position; it's a pseudo position. I call it. It's not really anything. It's just a center of activity. So if you have complex detection data, analysts love to slap a home range analysis on it. And, and, we, and there have been attempts to improve upon this and, and try to get slightly better positions or pseudo positions within arrays. So Richard Hedger and, uh, and, and, and their team in Quebec and Canada had a, a ton of receivers studying Atlantic salmon small migrations moving out of a river. Uh, and I had, yeah, so 62 receivers, uh, the, the hexagons were uh, 507 meters in, in diameter, and, and they did some simulations to see, okay, we, they didn't always know uh, exactly what the transmission range, so the t t detection range of the receivers for the tags would be, but they simulated different scenarios, uh, and they found that uh, uh, the, the detection range and how much they overlapped really affected their, their estimates of positions. So, they did some testing as well on the field, uh, and they were able to estimate some pseudo paths. But really importantly, they, they had no accounting for the clock drift. So any independent station that's uh, that's not linked to a satellite, like your phone is, the clock will drift because of natural uh, uh, poor estimates of time, essentially. So so multiple hydrophones receivers like this, that over time you may synchronize them to your computer exactly, but over time, they start to drift and the seconds apart, even minutes apart over time. And then uh, how can you really calculate accurately a position in between, in between the two? When a tag is that's sitting here, uh, the ping is registered at very different times on the receiver's clock. So, so pseudo positions are possible with these unsynchronized receivers. We can sort of estimate where a probable or a likely or, or just a possible location for the animal may have been. And it depends a lot on your research question and your tolerance for for error, and that and that that's that's really what what uh, what these these methods are is that they're all based on tolerance. There's Bayesian approaches to calculating centers of activity as well. Megan Winton is uh, is brilliant and does some really cool stuff with uh, with ecological statistics and tracking and, and uh, looking at spatial point processes to to improve upon centers of activity and actually calculate slightly better, more likely positions in, in receiver grids than simply taking the, the, the weighted average of the detections in some sort of uh, uh, in some sort of time interval of five or 15 minutes. They, so very cool. I you know when read the paper, went to the, the end and thought, okay, I'm gonna give this a try. And I said, uh, well, you know, this is this worked really well. We used a very small amount of data and when we tried to use more data and crashed the computer. So maybe someday this will actually be possible because it actually in theory it actually kind of works really well, but uh, but good luck actually getting it to run because it's so computationally expensive, it's kind of infeasible. So I've never done this. I probably wouldn't recommend it given they didn't even really get it to work very well on real data, but you know, maybe someday we can do some, uh, some of these, these Bayesian approaches to calculating pseudo positions. And, but you can get a lot of juice out of the orange. So if you, if you calculate centers of activity, you can do something what uh, Daly et al. Did in uh, with Giant Trevally. This is the Seychelles, beautiful island off of Africa. Uh, I actually was a reviewer on this paper, and I was critical of the the way they used the the home ranges. But uh, you can see they're calculating the home ranges of uh, of the Giant Trevally here, and they have receivers out here. They say, okay, this is the this is the the range of the Giant Trevally, but it's only because they happen to have a receiver here, and they didn't have a receiver here. The range of the Giant Trevally is much more likely to be something like this. But they just don't have receivers, so uh, their responses to my 
comments and review were that this, you know, this was the array they designed because they, they needed to know if it went here and that this was suitable to their study question and therefore knowing that this is the range size in this very particular design and context was <coughs> perfect and exactly what they wanted and needed for the management of Seychelles and, 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 and that's great. So they designed it nicely and they, they know what they're doing. But, but in general, it is important to really think about how, how these arrays and designs actually perform with home range analyses, polygons, and kernel utilization densities before simply uh, slapping it onto uh, an analysis with acoustic telemetry data with, with these pseudo positions. And it's not easy. I mean, it's very easy for me to be, be, be critical and provide advice when, uh, when, when you're out in the field and you have an island in the middle of the ocean where you, you can't just put out a thousand receivers out in you know, the, the Indian Ocean. It's, it's not so simple. I understand that, that, uh, that, that these are legitimate challenges and considerations, but it really is important to be aware of, of the biases that can emerge from different, uh, different analytical tools, uh, especially in really large open landscapes like the ocean or large lakes. So some consideration for positioning, really, how many receivers do you have and how on earth are you going to uh, arrange them? Pretty much all of us are are limited by the funding that we have, and that limits the amount of receivers that we can buy, and then that limits the study design, the design that we can have. I'm very sympathetic towards that, I and mean, that's, that's, that's life as we know it. Uh, but it's, it's very important, really, to, to think about where to place those receivers, and it's very hard to use receivers in areas where you, where you don't think the animals will go to say, okay, well, uh, we'll, put, we'll put it in this back bay because it's important to have coverage and, and confirm that the animals don't go there. But you know, that's a lot of money sitting in a back bay that's far away from your research site. You got to take the boat out and, and motor for several hours just to pick it up and be like, yeah, exactly as expected. Uh, nothing was there. But but some of the, uh, it is really important advice, and, and it's something that I advise really often to think about when designing arrays. Uh, it is to to ensure that there are some receivers placed in areas where. Uh, where one, you don't expect to get detections, uh, or two, that provide more comprehensive coverage of different habitat types, different area types, to confirm uh, presence and absence. And, and also, and I mean, some percentage of time, when you don't expect to see an animal, you, you still see it, and you, you learn new things about the ecology, and, uh, and exp it expands what we know about these species and, and their movements and their habitat requirements. And, uh, and, and it is, it is, it is dangerous in many ways to, to, to bias what we're studying simply by our expectations and, uh, and, and beliefs about what animals are doing. And, uh, and using simulations uh, and, and uh, simulating receiver locations in a, in a grid can really be helpful for actually determining where to place receivers in some ways because it does eliminate some of the biases, especially uh, if you're not doing positioning studies, but you're just looking for pseudo positions or networks. Uh, and, and I think that's a really important tool to, to try to uh, relieve, relieve some of the bias that, that can exist in, uh, in designing arrays. And certainly just designing grids as well, regardless of, of the, the areas, is, is very helpful. So when you have these pseudo positions, we talked a little bit about home range. You can also do these really cool resource selection uh, function studies. And Luke Griffin did this, uh, this awesome study in... Uh, I believe it was in Puerto Rico, where they had they they, used, they made habitat maps. And they used drones, I think, and underwater surveys to classify the different habitat te habitat types. You can use Kruging algorithms; they're they're surprisingly easy to implement in R, uh, and it can smooth over some of the positions you get. You get these nice habitat maps, uh, and then and then I looked at a variety of different species and, and how they selected resources. There's a little island here, uh, and looked at I think this lemon shark, bull shark, and uh, don't know what that is. Nurse shark probably. And, and they looked at the, the resource selection around the island. They were able to actually uh, match where the animals were moving in a network to the, the substrate types. And then they're able to calculate what are the preferred substrates, where do these animals prefer to be, uh, and, and how does that inform their, their habitat partitioning, competition, different uh, predation, different factors about the movement of, of a whole community uh, in this embayment or this bay in Puerto Rico. It's a very nice approach. Uh, resource selection functions are are very cool, they're very powerful, they're very implementable in R using packages like AMT. And we'll hear from Johannes Singer later this week about his, pack his package AMT and, and how to implement some of these tools. Very exciting. They, they do uh, have some issues as well with, with autocorrelation, but 
But in many cases, this, this is a really powerful tool that we can use with, with pseudo positions to better understand movements. But of course, pseudo positions, if you just have a center of activity and not a precise position, you don't really know if it's actually here and you're saying it's here because you calculated the center of activity. So it's difficult to use these pseudo positions. So let's go from, path, from, uh, from pseudo positions to paths, so, so precise positioning. And, and here's a small movement for that lake, and, and uh, you can see how, it's, uh, how we want to create this grid where we can actually use trilateralization to calculate the positions and see how it's moving through this bottleneck in the lake. So a path I designed here as a, a high dimensional fractal connecting a series of positions. That's a little bit complicated, but it's really, it's really just a series of, of precise positions that are connected through a path. So before we get into paths, uh, just want to open up any, any questions, any commentaries so far. Speed's okay, I think. I'm not getting too carried away yet. Check the time. I think we're doing okay on that as well. So the path, I'm going to bring this, this, uh, uh, this example back from the movement ecology paper because I think it's a, it's a really nice example of what we actually get from, from precise positioning. So, so you see we have these, this gridded design in this lake uh, in, in Czechia and, and re relatively small distances between receivers and allows us to use these trilateralization tools. Hey, it's Milan. It's his figure. Amazing. <laughs> Milan, it's your figure. That's so good. Uh, and, and, and so we have the raw, we, the, the, the raw positions. So the, these are calculated by trilateralization. And we have the, uh, the, the tench, so the, the small predator in the lake, and then the wells, the catfish, the big predator. Uh, it's the red, and the tench, the blue, sorry. Uh, and, and again, we can calculate the home range from this. And we, and we know because we have all the positions, and we have all the area covered with receivers, we know this is the true uh, the utilization distribution of these two, and wow, they're overlapping quite a bit. It's getting easy, probably. Uh, and you can look at trajectories, activity. I already went through this, but, but it's, it's, it's incredible that the amount of detail that you actually get from paths when you know, okay, the, the animal at this time was exactly at this position. Uh, the amount of detail and the analytical tools and the options that you have uh, really expand greatly. I'm uh, very excited to, to be here and to hear from some some experts and leaders in this field to, to learn about how to calculate some of these paths and, and some of the, the amazing tools that we can use to analyze these data once we, we actually have positions because it really is the, the, the hardest thing to know and, and, uh, and to overcome in aquatic telemetry is exactly where the animal is because when you only have a, a general idea from a, from a detection on a receiver and a network analysis or a pseudo position from a center of activity, you don't actually know where it was precisely. Uh, the options and the tools available to our disposal become much more limited and, and the conclusions that we can draw become uh, much more uh, uh, subjective, I suppose. But really knowing where the animals are really opens up new opportunities. So, so getting a path, it, it really isn't easy in water. It's, it's, it's incredibly difficult. Many people have spent uh, a long time trying to resolve some of these issues. Uh, we can get paths from GPS, that's fortunate. There's satellites circulating, circling the, the, the Earth at all times, and they, they can calculate exactly where uh, something is, but they, those satellites don't penetrate through water. Uh, so some people have used toad tags, which is very cool in shallow water. Uh, you can put a float on the back of a ray or a, a, a larger fish. They use them on basking sharks and, and species that swim near the surface, but not necessarily on the surface. And it's towed on the surface of the water. It connects to GPS at all times, uh, and you know pretty much exactly where it is with a little a little bit of error. Uh, so this is some some stingray tracks in, in in Australia. It doesn't it doesn't necessarily work extremely well all the time, and it's very limited for the number of species that you can, you can actually use it for. But that that's one way to get a position in water. And then of course there's trilateralization, so overlapping receivers. Uh, synchronizing receivers, uh, the receiver clocks, and then calculating positions in the middle end. Uh, uh, and many, many things uh, affect trilateralization success, and you need careful designs. Sometimes there's too much error. I've run into that problem myself many times. Uh, but, and, there, and, and this is a, a nice overview of, of some of the many factors in the environment when you're trying to conduct trilateralization. Uh, that can affect it. So your receiver geometry, of course, can affect it. So uh, that affects the speed of sound and the time that the tag transmissions take to move in between locations. Uh, receivers moving, so if you don't know the exact precise 
position and location of the receiver, it shifts a little bit. That's, of course, going to affect the, 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 the time that a tag takes to, to reach a, a receiver, and then it's going to affect your, your estimation of the position. All sorts of environmental variables that we have no control over, water movement, temperature, conductivity, uh, as well as wind and waves. Wind and rain are very noisy in the aquatic environment. They can dramatically reduce detection range. And oftentimes we do range testing in nice days. It's sunny. It's nice to be in the boat. You go have a drink. You tow the, you tow the tag around. Get your, uh, it's, a, it's a nice day. And you say, wow, the receiver range is so good. This is amazing. It works so well. Uh, and then you don't necessarily have good data on when the conditions are poor, which is at least half the time. It's raining, it's windy, it's wavy, uh, it's very noisy underwater, and all of a sudden your range is gone. Uh, other thing that can happen, of course, is you do range testing in the, the spring or the winter, and then all of a sudden the summer comes, the, the macrophytes grow, there's all sorts of weeds everywhere, uh, the transmissions are baffled, and, and you, can't, you, you don't have overlapping receiver uh, detection ranges anymore. Really, uh, testing, designing and testing arrays for trilateralization is, is, is very challenging. People that are good at it are, are, are very good at it because they have a lot of experience. And, um, and some of these papers that really help, help untangle the factors that, uh, that contribute to uh, performance uh, are, are very important to help us think about how to design better arrays, how to, uh, how to, how to implement better studies. Just out of curiosity, how, how many people are working with trilateralization and trying to get precise positions from their data with acoustic telemetry? Yeah, lots of people. It's, uh, it, the data that you get from it is, is fantastic. It's amazing. It's, it's very cool. Uh, how, how many people have had challenges or issues with actually implementing these studies and, and calculating precise positions because of a variety of, of, of problems? Fewer. Some people are doing great. Okay. <laughs> well done. And we also have multipath problems. So this is a, a really nice paper from last year looking at uh, JSAS. These are juvenile salmon acoustic telemetry tags. Uh, and, and these are uh, these require a really a really intimate understanding of the speed of sound and, and physics and how how sound travels through water. And, and I think we'll hear a little bit from from Henrik and maybe some other speakers about. Uh, uh, about experiences dealing with multipath and, uh, and, and YAPS, I know, has, has solutions to help eliminate multipath, but uh, sound is, is, is bouncy. It bounces off of things, so walls and cliffs and rocks, and, uh, and, and then you get these, these echoes, basically, uh, of sound in water. And, and the receivers hear those echoes just as well sometimes as they actually hear the initial transmission, but, but because they've, they've rebounded, the time of arrival of those echoes is, is different uh, from, the, from the time of arrival of the, the, the true signal. And then you get an imprecise position because, uh, because the, the time of arrival is really fundamental to calculating the position. So you can see here they, they've used some, uh, so, some, some novel methods, some machine learning to, to estimate which of these detections on the receiver are, are indicative of multi-path. So which ones are, are reflections or echoes and which ones are true positions. And then, and then filtering those out allows you to calculate more, more precise positions. So uh, Henrik's here with us today. So how do people, Henrik? <laughs> Henrik, Henrik's done an amazing job developing this package in R uh, called YAPS, yet another positioning solver. It's a great name, it's a great package, uh, it's a great tool for open source uh, uh, solving problems. There are other people that are working on this as well and implementing new solutions, trying to continue to, to improve the ability to estimate positions. So, so it uses time difference of arrival at known locations. So again, we have this gridded array with, with approximately equilateral triangles. And uh, the clocks are synchronized. Uh, there's, there's a synchronization model integrated into YAPS that allows you to, to, uh, to put all the receiver clocks at the exact same time uh, and then calculate the position uh, in the middle of the receiver or, or within the receiver grid allows you to estimate where the tag was and approximate the path. So this is a comparison of a, a unknown position from a GPS uh, to the performance of YAPS, and you can see it, it works extremely well uh, in this system for, for estimating the actual precise positioning, position and connecting the path. So there's a lot of complicated math. Uh, it's amazing when it works. I mean, look at this. This is incredible. You look out at a lake or the ocean, and you're like, imagine knowing exactly where all the fish are in there. Uh, imagine how powerful that would be. Well, we actually can now, and, and, and we can implement a lot of new tools with this. 
And and Miko is also uh, here with us today. Say hi to people, Miko. Hi. Done some amazing work. Some of my favorite in the whole world uh, on on the pearly razorfish. And we're going to get, get to hear a little bit more from him about that as well. Uh, pearly razorfish is a small a small fish that lives in the sand, uh, and and they've done some uh, incredible work to uh, to look at the ecology and the behavior and uh, and the life history of these animals. And, uh, and and I don't have time to go through it all. Unfortunately, we'll hear from. Them tomorrow, I think, uh, but uh, but you can see the very small grids here, so 50 meters in between the, the positions uh, off the coast of Mallorca. It must be a very nice place to work. It just looks beautiful, <laughs> nice fish, nice uh, nice sand, uh, and, but, but challenging conditions. These fish go into the sand at night, and they, they sleep in the sand, and then you, they just disappear. So you don't, you're not getting uh, like the full lifetime track necessarily. You have to, you have to interpolate a little bit, and, uh, that would also provide some cool opportunities for prototypes, things like that that they've, they've worked into. There's, there, there's people that are using these tools and using triangulation for amazing things. And uh, another consideration really important to think about is power output. So, so uh, the, the detection radius of the tags is really going to depend in many ways on how well those tags actually transmit. So we use synchronization time, tags a lot of the time. Uh, we know to use very large, very high power synchronization tags because we want them to, to transmit very far. Uh, but with, with the tags that we actually put in animals, sometimes we don't think quite as much about the power output of the tags and, and exactly how loud they're going to be within the array. So uh, it is strategic to really think and to, to discuss with manufacturers. This is not a, not a comprehensive list of, of all the options, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's a few examples of how much the, the decibels, so the, the acoustic power, can vary with different tag sizes and manufacturers. And, and it is important to, to ask these questions and think about what the tag power output is going to be when you're implementing a study. Also important to consider, I didn't put uh, so much in here, but uh, the frequency that the tag transmits on is also going to have an influence on the range. So, so tag power at 180 kilohertz is not necessarily going to be translatable to tag power uh, at 69 or 71 kilohertz. So uh, we don't really have a good idea or a good standard equation for, for how far a tag will transmit in a certain environment at a certain frequency. Uh, so we need, to, we need to consider this and continue to build a little bit of, of community knowledge about how to select tags, how to specify tags, and then, and then how to design good receiver arrays in consideration of this knowledge. Synchronization, so I, I said all, all clocks drift. That is a, that's a, a fact of life. Sound travel is very fast, so 1.4, 1.5 kilometers per second in water or something. That's about right, right, Henrik? Yeah, sounds about right. Uh, and, and so even tiny differences among receivers can throw off calculations. So, so we use these synchronization tools, uh, and we use these synchronization tags especially to try to sync up the clocks on receivers. You can also uh, link all receivers by cables. So this is a, a, uh, makes it a common timekeeping device. There are some people, I think, that have, have put buoys on the surface that, uh, that connect to satellites. There's a, there's a variety of different ways to synchronize clocks. Uh, but it is, it is often one of the hardest parts of, uh, of conducting trilateralization. That's right, right, Ina? Okay. You, the synchronization model is one of the hardest parts, like synchronizing the receivers. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult. And, uh, and, and if you can solve that, then it's, it's, uh, it, it can make the rest of the process quite easy. So, so really focusing on ensuring that you have good synchronization tags, you have good synchronization communication uh, among your receivers can really make your life a lot easier. And I'll show some examples of, uh, of my experience with this, which is providing uh, mixed results to put it uh, positively. So trilateralization tools, uh, Vemco VPS, the Vemco positioning system, this is a very familiar uh, type of positioning to many people. Many people refer to positioning systems as VPS, which is incorrect. There are a lot of different types of, of positioning systems. Vemco is one of them. Uh, it's expensive, so you have to pay Vemco to uh, get your positions back. That can be uh, uh, traumatic for some budgets. Uh, it's also a black box, so we actually have no idea how to calculate positions. You give them the data, they give you some positions back with something called HPE, which means horizontal position error. Uh, and, and there are a variety of studies that try to better understand what HPE means. Uh, but in general, there, there's a large number of studies that have used Venco VPS uh, with, a, with a large degree of success. Uh, people like it. it, it works quite well. There's a lot of good things to say about it. Uh, you can also conduct correlated random walks with crawl to try to estimate positions. Uh, I've talked about YAPS, we'll hear more about it. It's open source, it's flexible, uh, but always remember there's no free lunch. Hannah told me this once in an entirely different context and I've, I've remembered it forever. 
Uh, so make sure your receivers are well placed. Make sure your clocks can be synchronized. So really focus on the synchronization tags and make sure tags actually uh, are moving through the array. So ensure that you're, you're placing receivers uh, in areas where you can detect the, the animals. So a short foray into positioning. So this has been, been my, my life for the last year, really trying to be, be sustained by apps and uh, figuring out how it works and figuring out how I can make it uh, work for some of the data that I've, uh, I've collected. So why do we need positions? This is uh, a, a, a small example of, uh, of what it can be like. Centers of activity, it's very nice. It's very easy, it works very well. You get these pseudo positions, uh, calculated positions. Uh, it can be frustrating and, and, and difficult, and, uh, uh, but also very fun. I've enjoyed it very much, and I'm very grateful to, uh, to Henrik for the help he's, he's given in uh, not only our community and creating the tools uh, and, and the guidelines, but also answering some of my emails. Emphasis on some. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so this is this is Lake Vosting Rodnet. This is a uh, a lake that I'm working on in Norway uh, with uh, with with some of my, my colleagues, and, and we're trying to better understand what's going on with the trout in this lake. And and this is not a great array. So we're learning, we're getting better. That's okay. I'm, I'm gonna teach you some things not to do, some things to do. That's you know. That would be the, the talk today. So you can see we have uh, one receiver here with a sync tag, one receiver here with a sync tag. Ideally, we should have had at least two more sync tags. So lesson learned, we now have another receiver here, another receiver here, and another receiver here. So our array is, is getting better. We're trying to find more money, new resources to make this a little bit better. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 11 receivers in this lake. And, you can, and we can calculate the center of activity. So this is one fish on one day. Uh, this is a two minute center of activity. It's a five minute center of activity. Yep. How frequent the tags can be? Yeah, great question. These are 60 to 120 seconds. And a 10 minute center of activity. So you can see that the scale that you decide on really can influence the amount of data. And you can see, do we see any likely spot where the fish actually ever was? Not really, but we're pretty confident, no matter how we slice it, that the fish was in this part of the lake. If that's all we want to know, well, that's great. That's okay. And uh, <laughs> uh, so, so to start working with YAPS and to start uh, conducting trilateralization, you really need three data frames. Uh, you have your hydrophones. So you have your receiver locations, depth, sync tags, uh, YAPS has, has very specific naming conventions for these things. Uh, you have tag detection, so you have one, one file for your sync tags, one file for your fish, uh, and these are unsynchronized. So you're, you're starting to split up your detection data. You have, you have your big detection data frame in, uh, in R, presumably. You split that into the hydrophones, your sync tag detections, your fish detections, and they also want a temperature file. So uh, various receiver uh, types will collect temperature, Water temperature affects the speed of sound, and so it's going to affect the ability to actually position your tags. So uh, it's actually, I guess it's four data frames because the sync tags and the fish, de fish detections are different, but I only have three pictures of pink so I had to put them all together. And this is what, it, this is what it's like you know, using uh, data table or tidyverse to, to split up your, uh, your detection data into these data frames that you need. And so this is this is back to our uh, our uh, study in in Ireland in the lake. And you can see the longitude of the receiver location or the receiver station. Uh, number of sync tag detections, two sync tags. You can see okay, it's it's detecting okay here, detecting okay here. There's a lot of detections, but the 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 overlap is, is quite poor. There's really only one receiver that's consistently overlapping with the sync tags, and that's that's kind of the the, the backbone of the ability to synchronize. Because if you're if you're if, if if this one falls out then we're not really synchronizing the whole array. You just kind of, uh, we, we'd only have sort of a synchronization here and a synchronization here. And there's a better way to look at this, of course. Uh, so we have syn synchronization tag here and here. You can see that these synchronization tags are, are communicating to different parts of the network with a little bit of overlap here. Uh, that's a long way to go. So another synchronization tag here would probably go a long way to, to help this array. What do you think, Henrik? Okay, so we'll do that. That's a good thing to do. 
And then we run the synchronization model. Henrik will teach us a little bit more about this, but in general, we want to have this, this distribution with relatively low error, uh, indicating that the synchronization model is, is, is successfully synchronizing these receivers in some way. It's a pretty good synchronization model, kind of. Uh, we can see that uh, the two sync tags on receiver number one and receiver number nine uh, have relatively stable error. And this is, this is the code that I wrote to, uh, to format these data. So I have my detection data, I'm filtering out uh, NAIDs and, uh, and, and calculating fractional seconds and epoch and everything. Uh, and and Henry always reminds me that I, I should not be using tidyverse. Need to learn data data tables. So I print this out and put it at my my workstation. So it, it reminds me to to take care of this data table. It seems very powerful, very good thing to learn. I, I probably should recommend other people learn it. But for now, I use tidyverse for all this. Uh, I have a, a tutorial for this lake and this data set that I put into GitHub. I haven't shared it yet because I'm still working on some of the kinks, but it'll be available. Uh, with, with a set of data from this lake for a month. Uh, you can download it, play with my code, see if it works, borrow the code. Uh, if you work with Tidyverse and not with data table, then some of this stuff will be helpful because it took me a while to translate some of the data table code that Henrik uses into Tidyverse because I can't read data table. Uh, if you read data table, that's great. But but uh, but anyway, at, at some point, you, well, right now it's on my GitHub, which is the only thing on my GitHub. I don't really use GitHub, but, but it's available to you all to, to use, including some data to try to learn and help you out a little bit. So steps to get positioned to synchronize your clocks. I tried to get a, a picture of, uh, of George Clooney in Ocean's Eleven with a scene to synchronize your watch where I can find one to took too much time. You can see that this is just sort of the, the epoch time. So it's a, it's a numeric time. And, and you can see that there's, there's differences already that uh, these, uh, the sync tags are arriving at different times at different receivers. It's going to help us synchronize. We can see that the time that a synchronization is it takes to be detected at different receivers uh, is, is quite variable. Uh, and that, that has to do with the speed of sound, which is why it's important to use temperature and calculate precise speeds of sound. And then you run the apps, which is kind of like dr drinking from a fire hose. And, uh, uh, and you get to watch it run, and when it, it's, it's fitting, it looks really cool, and then sometimes it, it actually fits, and that's amazing. So some thoughts on challenges with this and, and my experience with it. Getting ac accurate depth for receivers is very important. You don't just want the horizontal positions. You want to also know how deep the receiver is. Uh, it can be very hard to actually get precise depths for receivers, whether you're working in lakes or oceans, uh, using depth meters and uh, and, and the wind is blowing and you're not sure if you're, the rope is exactly 90 degrees or if you're a little bit off, uh, that I think is a big problem and a challenge. Uh, ensuring vertical orientation of deep receivers. We work in, lake, in lakes that were carved out by glaciers that kind of go like this. And so we don't always know that our receiver is sitting nice and flat and vertical. Uh, there's the, obviously Vemco TX receivers can transmit tilt and the new TBR. Telmo TBR 800 receivers can transmit tilt values and give you an indication if it's standing upright. That's very important. Uh, we're changing waters oftentimes in tidal zones or uh, or where the water is regulated, so the depth actually changes by you know meters sometimes, and, and that can change that can affect the speed of sound transmissions, uh, especially in shallow areas. Uh, <laughs> So uh, oblique receiver angles and oblong triangles. We always talk about trying to get these, these equilateral, equilateral triangles. So we get a nice grid with triangles or hexagons, uh, but sometimes we actually have these, uh, we're forced because the, 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 the shape of the coast, we sometimes have these very acute or, or uh, 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 oblique angles. Uh, do we just delete erroneous tracks or positions if they don't fit very well, very well if they're on land? We just get rid of them and say, okay, well, it's actually like a, uh, a 40 minute gap in between good positions and we'll just forget about those and, uh, and, and can, we, can we make user defined tweaks effectively so so how well can we actually build on some of these tools uh, and, and, and communicate those so that new people can can integrate fixes to bugs and things like that. So it, when it actually works uh, it looks really cool. Uh, this, this is these are actually kind of bad positions uh, because I didn't make a very good synchronization network and uh, probably didn't have enough receivers to get a lot of detections. So these are probably erroneous positions, probably not much better than centers of activity, but that's all right. I won't publish anything about it. I'll just sort of keep trying to learn, but you can see at least there's, you know, it looks cool. You can use GG anime package. Uh, this is uh, Saren. She works with us uh, in, in the telemetry group at Norse. And, 
uh, sent her pictures from the field sometimes, and she snapchatted me this with, oh my god, migration. I thought it was great. Using the last talks. So this is a great communication tool. You can see that we're getting more information than we did with the centers of activity. We're, we're getting there, and, and maybe we'll learn a little bit more about this from, from Henrik this afternoon, and maybe I'll even get a little bit better. So once you actually have the positions and the paths, the fundamental unit that you want to study really for a lot of analyses is the step. And that is, I'm not sure if that's obvious, but it, it took me a while to really grasp that, that what this is really breaking down for us is, is the step. So the change in position over time. And, and this is there's the sand, this is just lines that I drew in different colors, but you can see these are these are what you ultimately get the, like the, the most, I guess the second most basic unit of information from a track, from a GPS tag, or uh, or a, a Vanco VPS, or a YAPS track, you have a path, and you can subsample it down to different time points. So, so at, at at this moment it was here, and then it moved here. Two minutes later it was here, and then here, and then here, and then here. So you can see there's different speeds associated with these tracks because there's you you have a relatively fixed sampling interval, but but different uh, different spatial distances traveled. And, and, and the concept of this step really, I, I cannot overemphasize how important it is because, uh, because the, these tools like HMMs, the hidden Markov models that we'll learn about from Roland this afternoon, these are based on, on the step. Uh, step selection functions that we'll learn about from Johannes uh, on Friday, these are based on the step. So the, the, the step is really what you want and you really want to understand and think about what the step means. And, uh, and there's two fundamental properties of the step. It's, the length of the step, not very difficult to calculate or conceptualize, and the angle of the step, so the turning angle. And there's a variety of packages, AMT, uh, Animal Movement Tools, Johanna Singer's package in R, does a very good job uh, of calculating step lengths and turning angles from movement data. And then once you have le step lengths and turning angles, there's a variety of analy analytical tools you can use uh, to understand it. When you, and when you think about it as well, the distance that, that, that an animal moves and the angle at which it moves really determines or describes a lot about what it's what it's actually doing in its environment. Uh, if, if it's traveling with very low uh, turning angles, it must be traveling directionally. So it must be migrating or dispersing. If it's traveling with really, uh, really small turning angles, then it must be really spinning around and potentially feeding or, or having sight restricted uh, movement. If it's tra traveling with really long step lengths, then it must be moving fairly quickly because you're sampling at a fairly fixed interval. Whereas if it's traveling with very small step lengths, then it must be moving very little and, and being uh, uh, potentially sedentary or, or resonant. So, so just these two metrics that you can pull out of a path describe almost, almost everything that we want to know about the, the ecology of the animal. And of course, when we have depth tags and pressure sensors, this path, the, the, these step lengths and turning angles can occur in three dimensions. So simply calculating a 2D position in a lake or, or, or a river or an estuary may be insufficient to actually properly estimate the length of the, the step and the turning angle uh, of the step. So uh, just especially for this afternoon and the rest of the week, really understanding that, that all these positioning tools that we're, that we're using are are fundamentally about understanding the steps. Uh, I think it's really foundational to a lot of what we're gonna do this week. And then you can do amazing things like what we're gonna learn about from Roland with the hidden Markov models. There's, uh, these have been developed for a very long time in a lot of different fields. You can do hidden Markov models on, uh, on baseball data, on soccer data, you can do it on, uh, on market forces. So you can look at prices of stocks and look at hidden Markov models. And, and Roland will tell you more about it because I don't really understand it very well, but. Uh, but at least with animal movement data, we're able to pass these, these positions and these step lengths into a model. Uh, so yeah, here you see the step length. And you can see that there's, uh, there, there's a distribution of step lengths and, and most of this, uh, and turning angles. Uh, and, uh, or, sorry, this is turning angles, step length. Uh, so you can see that most of the step lengths are, lengths are small. There's a histogram of step lengths. Mostly they, they move very little and then you get a, 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 a long tail distribution of long step lengths. And, and this distribution for animal movement is, is, is very fundamental in many ways. Uh, and, and this is a great study on trigger fish in, in Carolina. 
Cape Lookout, I guess. And you can see they have this grid, they have these positions, and, and then using these positions, they calculate the step lengths and the turning angles, and they're able to identify that there's three states in the model. So the hidden Markov models identify states and state transitions, and, and then the, the user, the analyst, has to kind of interpret those. So, so typically with the three-state model, it would be resting, moderate activity, and high-intensity activity. And then you can actually put that back on the map and the landscape, and you can and you can make this this behavioral state landscape. So the hidden Markov model identifies identifies your states, and you say, okay, they're, they're most likely to be in state one here. Say so this is uh, this is probably resting because it's a, a low step length. Number one, purple. And you say, okay, these are resting areas. So what's going on here? Are these reefs? I mean, triggerfish like to live in reef habitats. So probably those are gonna correspond with landscape fe features. I'm gonna assume that they're traveling a little bit with the yellow, maybe. Uh, I think so. And then probably foraging with the, with the turquoise. So you can start to see an activity landscape and how, uh, how the landscape actually corresponds to, to features of the movement, which is, which is astonishing. And you simply can't do this with pseudo positions uh, or with networks. You need these precise positions and these paths in order to implement these. And Kim Oreski and, and, uh, and Henrik Bautoff and I sort of worked a little bit on, on integrating hidden, hidden Markov models into YAPs and this, this, uh, uh, this new algorithm called YAMS, which is yet another uh, movement, uh, Mark Markov solver. Uh, and you can see these pipe data in the, the example, we, we do the exact same thing. So there's a three-state model, and you can see that there's uh, there's three different states. And this is this is a simultaneous solver that uh, that identifies the position using YAPS and then identifies the state using a hidden Markov model, which is very cool and something that, that will be in, integrated into, into YAPS by the end of the year. And then you, you can also use generalized additive models. And we're extremely lucky to have Eric Peterson here from, from Concordia University in Canada. It's a, it's a very long way to come. Thank you for coming here. It's very excited to hear your talk with because GAMS, these, 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 these spatial models are, are extremely valuable and, and flexible methods of studying movement. And this is some of uh, Lata's work. She's, she's here today with us as well. Wait with people, Lata. <laughs> Uh, she's doing some really cool work with trout in this lake in, in Ireland. You've already seen this lake, and you've seen that uh, it, you've seen that the, the, position, the positions don't work so well yet. So this is centers of activity, but but you can see that that on this landscape, that uh, using acceleration values, so the, we're using acoustic tags that transmit uh, uh, root mean square error of, of acceleration. You can see that in this landscape, using this generalized additive model, we can start to see hot spots. Uh, and cold spots in activity. So, so where are the trail most active? Well, uh, in this corner, which happens to be where there's a hydropower station, uh, where are they least active? It seems to be a, along the edges here, uh, and and that probably means that they're they're using these these areas in the middle to uh, to move. So, so they're they're kind of transiting through the middle and then spending uh, resting time along the edges, which is actually where they spend most of the time. Uh, and the, these these hierarchical generalized additive models are, are really exciting tools, and, uh, and and we'll learn a little bit more about that from Eric and how we can use some of these positioning tools. And step selection functions, we'll hear about these from Johannes Singer. These are amazing. So you can uh, show the resource selection function paper by uh, Luke Griffin, and, and you can discretize habitats. You make a habitat map. You take a drone. You fly it over a habitat, uh, or or you you. Uh, simply take visual observations with GPS points and use a Kriging algorithm, uh, and you can calculate what the landscape looks like. And this is some of uh, Shannon Landowskis' uh, thesis work. Uh, she worked with uh, uh, triangulating, uh, triangulated trilateralization of lobsters in Cape Breton, Canada. And you can see the tracks of these lobsters. They seem to have this really, uh, this real affinity for these certain habitat patches, which is which is cool and and. Uh, and it's hard to analyze it precisely, but but with these new uh, new step selection function tools, you can actually simulate distributions around each uh, each point and say, okay, there's there's a lot of different directions that it could move. What's the habitat where it could move, and then what's the probability that it that it would make the step that it made given the habitat, and that allows allows you to actually calculate the uh, affinity for different habitat types. So you can see here, uh, these are five different lobsters. Only three of them had particularly good data and coarse sediment with veneer of mud. So that is, 
I think that's light blue. So you can see that uh, different lobsters have different affinity for these different habitats with these step selection functions. And again, in order to do these, you need the steps. So you need the positions. You, you, you just can't do this with, without steps. You, to do a step selection function, you need steps. To get steps, you need paths. To get paths, you need positions. So it all, it all links back to really having these, these good tools for positioning. Uh, and, and Johannes will talk a little bit about his package and movement tools on Friday uh, and tell us a little bit about uh, the step selection functions, which is exciting. And there's this new paper by uh, uh, Toganov uh, in Methods in Ecology and Evolution, which I think is, is, is a very cool, uh, very important contribution uh, about menotaxis, which is uh, uh, a new word to me, but it essentially means moving with the environment. So how does the wind, how does the current, how does temperature affect movement of animals? So menotaxis uh, is something that is now possible using hidden Markov models and these tools. Uh, and, and here's a good example of how step length, again, we see the step, a uh, very important feature of the movement path, and how it relates to wind speed. So, so step lengths increasing with wind speed, we see that there's evidence of menotaxis. Uh, and you can see with different animals, you, there's, there's different potential environmental indicators of behavior that exist. And we can, we can actually test how, how behavioral states occur relative to the environment with these positioning tools. So some concluding thoughts. Positioning can be problematic. So uh, at receiver locations, all we, all we have to start with is whether a tag was detected on that receiver. So when we download our data, that's all we have. And we need to find ways to actually derive positions from that. And that's, and that, that's the challenge. So uh, we, can only, we can only make inferences within the receiver array. So this works very well in small ponds, works pretty well in lakes. It's very difficult in huge lakes. It's impossible in the whole ocean. We can massively make, make uh, misestimations of key, key parameters uh, if movement occurs beyond the array. So again, we need to think about the resources that we have, the questions that we have, and how to design an array and implement a study in a way that covers what we need to cover, answers the questions that we have. Positioning is fantastic. It provides a lot of information, but if you can only position in a small area of, the, of a study system, it's not sufficient in many cases to answer your questions. We have missing data, of course, on untagged animals. So uh, it's very challenging to understand social dynamics in real world environments where uh, there are untagged individuals that are potentially uh, moving with your tagged animals. I just want to kind of make a point about that a little bit with the step selection functions, because uh, this is really important because there's only, uh, I think, 30 lobsters tagged in this area, but there's probably like a thousand other lobsters here. So, so the fact that some of these lobsters are using specific habitats may be really a consequence of things like competition or maybe a consequence of, of predators. And, and we don't have those tags. We don't actually really know a lot of the context that are driving some of these relationships between, between individuals and their habitat. Uh, and and I, I, it's really important to understand that this can be a potential driver and can, it can have potential influence. And it's very nice in experimental setup. Sometimes you can manipulate ponds. You can manipulate areas uh, with, based on the, the density. Uh, you can you can add you can stock more individuals into a stocked pond and, and understand how how density affects habitat selection, resource use, uh, uh, behavioral states. But but it is really important to understand that that a lot of the dynamics in nature that we can observe can be a function of things that we simply are not measuring, which is often the biotic community, so competition, uh, predation, as well as disease in many cases. Uh, and, and it really works best for, uh, for massive arrays. So the dream scenario is you have a, a infinite receivers and you can put them out and you can grid an entire area. This is kind of what the, the uh, bird and mammal researchers uh, on land are able to do. They don't have to have massive arrays and grids, but they're, they're able to get huge coverage with, with global positioning systems and get per fairly precise positions across large landscapes and actually implement a lot of these analyses uh, without such, uh, such strife. Uh, 
But there's amazing opportunities. I love this paper by Jens Kranz in 2013 called Reality Mining. Uh, reality mining simply means uh, uh, using digital tools to make fine scale observations. And it's, uh, reality mining was, was uh, coined as a term for studying human behavior based on tracking our phones. So the, there's people downloading all the movement data from our phones and seeing how we interact with our environment and, uh, and, and using apps to look at uh, uh, where you run, where people are running or walking on Strava, and, and how they're inter interacting with the environment. And do, do people like using parks? Are they avoiding certain areas? Do we need to uh, increase the or improve the paths in these areas because people aren't walking there? That's kind of reality mining. But for animals, we can we can conduct reality mining as long as we have these these positions and as long as we have these tools available that allow us to to make calculations. Uh, we can study habitat selection with reality mining and position. We can study competition, predator-prey dynamics. We can look at disease. We can look, look at the effects of fishing. Uh, we can study pollution. There's some really cool studies that are going on in Sweden on, on pollution and their, their effects on behavior. We can study landscape effects, so landscapes of fear, landscapes of energy, uh, the environmental influence, so minotaxis, as I, I pointed to the uh, the Togonaut paper. We can use we can use replicated ponds and lake areas to do treatment and control experiments that, that really very few people are, are able to do other than aquatic researchers. And on land, it's, it's basically impossible to, to conduct these kind of studies. We have the capacity to do, to do properly replicated experiments with treatment and control groups. Uh, and, and that leads us to, the, to reality mining. So I definitely encourage people that are working with these systems to think about the, the, the unbelievable opportunities that we have using these positioning systems and, get, and collecting these data. Uh, computing is, is a big issue with this. Uh, uh, the number of cores and, and the random access memory on a computer or a server is going to determine what you can do in many cases. Uh, I've, I've melted several computers into the ground. Uh, my computer only has 16 gigabytes of RAM, but I also have access to a cloud server that I use. Uh, I encourage you all to talk with your universities or institutions about whether or not they have an RStudio cloud server or whether or not they'd be willing to get one. It has dramatically improved my quality of life. Uh, it doesn't run on my, things don't run on my local machine. I can shut the computer off and it still runs in the cloud when I wake up in the morning, open the cloud up and the code is run. It's, uh, I don't know how it works, why it works, or why it's not more common, but it, it seems like an essential tool that, that everybody should have access to. And uh, talk to your department, tell you, tell them that this is a tool that you need, and, and make your life just a little bit better. So I talked to Pep Alos at Spanish National Research Council. They use 46 cores of 256 gigabytes of RAM, uh, a supercomputer essentially. Uh, that's you know. 16 gig gigabytes of RAM on my local machine is, you know, pales in comparison to that. It's, it's, it seems impossible to do the same thing. Uh, and this this paper by uh, Ruben Peer uh, does some <clears throat> some analyses of different uh, graphical processing units and computer processing units for uh, processing reverse GPS, which is um, uh, radio tracking data that they do in Israel. Uh, and re strongly recommends an NVIDIA GPU uh, over high-end CPU stacks. So uh, there are there are there are technological solutions as well to upgrade computers uh, that have the potential to make uh, uh, some improvements to to our ability to actually run some of these analyses. So little overview: Do you really need paths? They're the best, they're amazing, you can do awesome things, but some questions, they can be, they can be answered with that. There are biases that we've gone through a little bit, important to be aware of, but uh, before implementing a study, uh, really important to think about what the data you actually need will be. Uh, prepare a realistic budget, uh, positions are resource intensive, it's gonna take time, it's probably gonna take money, may need, to do, may need a new computer, may need a server, uh, may need to uh, call in some favors and get some help, uh, do you know your study system very well? Uh, it may seem obvious, but uh, we've certainly, I've certainly had personal experiences going to new rivers and new, new lakes right next door to the one that I've worked in and uh, expect it to be the same, and, and it's just not. So many, many of these areas are not created equal for positioning. Uh, you need to consider the, the bathymetry, uh, the flow, the different challenges. Uh, are your receivers going to be knocked over by drifting objects going down a river? That's, uh, you know, you lose a receiver, you can lose your entire path to positioning. Uh, noise or interference, it can be really frustrating. So some lakes and some, 
some uh, marine areas are very loud because of uh, boat traffic. There's also snapping shrimp in the tropics that uh, make it almost impossible to hear any tags at night. So I talked to some friends that work in Hawaii and they say, at first we thought all of our fish just went offshore at night and then we realized the snapping shrimp are just overloading the receiver with noise and we just can't hear anything at night. So we just, we only study the fish during the day. That's, we can't stop the snapping shrimp. Uh, Animals that exit the array, of course, it's impossible to study, so understanding the probable dynamics of your species is important. Uh, and, and take the time to test, learn from my mistakes, make sure everything's going to be synchronized, uh, do some test tracks, do some tow tracks, uh, and really make sure that you're designing arrays as, as best they can be. Uh, that, that's the end of, uh, of my talk. Everybody was, was paying very nice attention. I appreciate it. I think it, was, uh, I think it went very well. I would love if you would uh, check out my survey on acoustic telemetry. It's about 20 quick questions. Want to better understand the user group and best practices in telemetry. Uh, identify new focal areas for, for developing tools in telemetry. Uh, and, uh, and over 100 responses so far. So. Uh, Really would appreciate it if people would check this out, and, and if you like uh, to fill it out, that would be awesome. QR code is here, the link is here. I can send it to you as well. But uh, but I think this is uh, looking at the results so far, uh, taking a peek, peek behind the curtain. I think ultimately this is going to give some really cool information about how people are designing studies and implementing studies, and that'll help identify some new areas for development. So I'll go back to the review. Thank you so much for your attention and, and for having me here to present. I've enjoyed it very much and, and hope there's some time for some questions. Thank you, Ro. Yeah, yeah. Very good times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for such a lovely overview. I guess that we all enjoy it. Am I right, our two participants? Are you still there? <laughs> okay, so I guess that we yes. have... <laughs> great. I guess that, yeah, we have a great time. Uh, so we have time for many questions, actually. So I guess that you can, you know, moderate the discussion yeah. yourself, I guess. Henry, what do you think? I don't have any questions. <laughs> Comments? Excellent presentation and nobody will uh, Thank you. Excellent. Glad I went, glad I went to you first. Renal? What? Comments? Oh, great. Here are some questions. Oh, okay. From Anja? Anja? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so with, with centers of activity, how do you account for duplicate detections? Uh, I cannot hear you, I'm sorry. Uh, I think it's still. Yeah, it should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. Uh, so a question from Anya, thank you for the question, Anya, was uh, when calculating centers of activity, if you suggest to have overlapping detection ranges, how do you deal with overlapping detection ranges and, and having duplicate detections? Uh, centers of activity are a weighted average, so you want duplicate detections in a way so that it weights it more towards receivers that have heard the transmission more times. The theory is that when you have over, overlapping detection ranges, a, a nearer receiver will hear the tag more frequently, so it will bias, or not bias, but I, but it will it will weight the position of the average position more towards the receiver that hears it more. So duplicate detections are actually a, a kind of a feature of uh, of centers of activity and not a bug. Someone couldn't hear me very well. Sorry. Yeah, I think that was the same. Yeah, same question. Anya, if you're still there, just let me know if that clarifies. You can turn on your camera and mic as well. We can hear you if you'd like to speak. No problem. Milan! One question. Uh, do you have actually any like, 
Do you know about and like theoretical work about this, you know, step planning uh, and relation with home range and learning angles and these things? Uh, not really. Just what we discussed a little bit yesterday with Eric. But uh, yeah, no, I think it's an I think it's an interesting question to try to check into with some of the data that we have how home ranges and how individual area use and core core areas are related to their step length and turning angle. I, I suspect that a home range is really a product of how far they move and how if you want to derive these things, you need to somehow you know justify that this is correlates together or somehow it's related that you can use it as a proxy of if you don't, that's somehow if you thought, even if you connect learning angle and step one, somehow, somehow together, and know how this curve should be more. The best test I've seen is actually kind of dating back to like early moving colleges. Actually, using like mean square displacement as a measure of yeah. like home range because it, it integrates. The issue of trying to use like either distribution is definitely or pretty similar. Like, the more if you've got a very torturous path, it could a very tight home range, or it could be getting long and twisted and going out. So, you know, I've seen things that just like loop forever. But it looks like, you know, it, it could be either moving in a circle around the home range, or it could be them just like looping in that. Yeah, so you really have to look at like an integrated measure over a long period of time. Like, things like means for this question are probably more useful measure for that than any sort of like purely individual step is. Yeah, so, so the question was how turning angles and step lengths can be related to uh, home range of, of, of animals and uh, Eric pointed out that there's some research by Turchin and early movement ecology literature uh, about how mean square displacement is, is a, an effective uh, measure in some ways or approximation of, of what we call home range. I see someone with a hand up in here, but it looks like it was taken down. Yeah, Maybe, yeah thanks a lot for your very, very nice presentation. <laughs> Good job. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you came across already uh, in studies like some people doing a very well study on the performance of their systems. Because I was thinking like if you apply home range analysis and center of activity analysis, then you assume that the detection probability in the system is everywhere the same. And which we know is not the case in reality because detection ranges on one side of the lake can differ from another part of the lake or the river. And that's something that I um, would really love to have also like very good examples of people that that, uh, that show like this is how we first analyze the performance of our system to then take into account these differences when applying the, the, the method. And since you have a great view on the literature about this thing, I was just wondering if you ever already came across through such study. Uh, yeah, so the question was about how for the people online, how the performance of the array can bias measurements such as centers of activity. And I haven't seen or I don't recall a very thorough study on that. <clears throat> However, it really re relates to the general question about how receiver range affects everything that we study. And in my opinion and experience, we do range testing and we generally know a little bit about the range of receivers uh, and then we struggle to find a meaningful way to incorporate that into any sort of analytical tool, centers of activity being a good example. Um, it's a big challenge really. I mean, I've, I've heard of people talk about trying to weight <laughs> observations by the range so that uh, observations on receivers with poorer range will get compensated with more weight, but in practice, I've never actually seen that. See, I see Eric is maybe thinking a little bit about this. Yeah. Yeah. So again, yeah, let's chat over lunch about it. Maybe maybe we can solve it somehow someday. All right, there's a hand up in the chat. 
you can unmute and just ask if you like or put it in the chat. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you very much for your very informative talk. Um, I have one more question according like for um, centers of activity and step length. When you calculate them, you use um, like time steps. And um, how to set the time steps? You said like you can calculate for five minutes or 10 minutes or one hour, you use 15 minutes. I assume these time steps um, depend on your like species and system, but can you give some, some guidelines how to find the time steps? Yeah, so time steps to calculate centers of activity. Um, yeah, I, th I think what it depends, it depends on two things, one, mostly, I guess. One would be the, res the, the tag transmission intervals. So uh, we use, uh, for small fish, we use 30 to 60 second transmit intervals. And for larger fish, we often use 60 to 120 or even, uh, even more infrequent. So that will make a big difference in how many detections you want to integrate into a center of activity. And then as you pointed out, the, the, the behavior and the expected movement of the animal through the array. Um, I, beyond that, I don't, I, I don't have like a fixed number or, or fixed guideline for selecting an interview interval. Uh, usually what I, what I test most of the time that I calculate centers of activity is for examples, just visualizations like the ones I showed. Uh, and usually I test uh, 5, 15, and 30 minutes because they're sort of generalizable uh, chunks. But yeah, I don't really have uh, any specific advice beyond that. It's uh, the, the, longer the, the longer the interval you use, the more data you lose, and the, the, in some ways, the less precise the position is going to be that you calculate or the pseudo position that is going to be. Yeah. Um, and that and and I usually balance that out against uh, the fact that if you calculate in a smaller window, like two or four or, or six minutes, uh, then you're also usually basing that you're, you're not getting quite as much of a, uh, a waiting on the receivers that hear it more. So 10 minutes, I, 10, 10 and 15 minutes are usually my go-to because you get more of, a, more of a weight on the receivers that it, hear it more. And so you're more likely to get a little bit closer to where it actually is. Other thoughts for now? I think I would start with a minute, like you said, depending on the transition tags, I'd start perhaps just to be safe with a minimum of expected three detections, just so you have it's your average, right? So you have yeah. some kind of measure of error. Yeah. Just to correct for that. But I think the, the safest way would be doing some kind of uh, kind of sensitivity analysis, where if you're looking, for example, at the size of the whole thing, you try give it a vector of some kind of things and just try out them and see where it breaks down. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. That's sensible. At some point, you hopefully maybe completely random, which just highlights. The weakness of this method, right? The issue of the method. Yeah. But uh, hopefully, if you're looking, if you can imagine the x axis time interval, right? The numeric, yeah. And the y the variable you're looking at, be it, for example, the size of home range, hopefully, you'll see it at one point you get a good trade off between not using too much data, but also not. Yeah. I, I think the other consideration that I just thought of is. It, it depends a little bit on, on if you have it, full complete coverage of an, an embayment or, or a lake, or if you have gaps. So certain areas that I've done position averaging, it's, it doesn't have complete coverage. There's like areas on the side or above or below the array that the fish could be. And so uh, if you have too small a window, then you just will get a bunch of blanks. But if you have a larger window, then you'll, you're more likely to get a position in every bin for every fish. So it depends on the amount of data and the quality of the array that you have as well in some ways. Yeah. yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. Question maybe? I, I, before I, it was a very good talk, I have to say. And uh, just I have one question that maybe some guys know and might be interesting for guys who are starting with 
How much do you think that we can violate actually the regularity for position? Regularity of? Of the grid of your array. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, sometimes you cannot place those three zeros perfectly from the node yeah. grid. And maybe it's for an echo or for memory. Yeah, so the question was how, how much can you violate the regularity and the, the equilateralarity of the grid uh, and still get good positions? Any go? I, I was told when we were setting up this, this array, but the people who noted that actually having it too regular yeah. was, not, was not also good. <laughs> because when estimating the positions, you could have, sometimes you have like a the model has two lateralization algorithm that may have more than one solution. And it happens more when, when everything is super regular. Because the position can be sometimes in one side or like in the B and B or the So having a small variability in between the solution, between the receivers, they told us that was better than having them like perfectly. And they could be this small tech, uh, small tech, new one. Yeah. yeah. And actually, it was a fact that we were not able to put them. I mean, we wanted to put them on the other one, but it was for the whole system. So, and then we just start throwing it inside the wind, you do the right. So, finally, you got, you got this small irregularity. Uh, yeah. But this has not to be like uh, super large. Yes, so we don't know the vision. I need to work with one. And there is actually another option in the cloud collection of position. What I know that you know, there is this land cost that you need to send them data. You have three apps that you can, you can put your data in some open source. And there is this OPEX software for OPEX equipment, yeah. which actually the, this, I don't think that is something to be, but they give you software and you can actually calculate the investment. Many times as you want, so you don't need to pay every time for calculations. But it's also some, some, yeah, that we can get in and see what is really good. Yeah, there's also the Telma pinpoint as well, so you can send the data there and get position estimates from that. Not sure if Sonatronics has one. Just to be just fair, uh, the PTS. I think they have a different store like them that you call PPS that, so you pay for a certain type and you use it more like you have, like online. Right? So, you go with it. so they used to price it by touch. So it's so expensive and they still price it by a number of tags, a number of receivers, but it's, yeah. it gives you some kind of an extended period to use the more control. Yeah. But all the rest still stands like that box. Henry? Yeah, just circling back to the question by me about the uh, array configuration. Um, the code problem depends very much on the software you use, but I don't use that now. But you can, in your experience, deviate quite a lot from this optimal trial, the equilateral trial setup. You can really do some weird stuff. The only thing you need to avoid is to have everything on the script line. If you have that, then uh, it's getting quite hard. As long as you have kind of two dimension in your grid and you have overlapping detection measures, it should work pretty well. That's great. <laughs> okay, guys, I guess that's. Uh, there is one more question from the virtual participants. There is one more from Anna. Uh, I guess that the hand is raised, you know, all the time. <laughs> Oh, Anya, do you have another question? <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> Me, thank you. Okay, so guys, I think that uh, we can. Uh, what about to give Rob another?
now it's time for lunch, so we can just leave the room and follow me and I will guide you to the canteen. And we are going to lock the room, so there is no need for you to pack your stuff. But guys, one more thing, there is an attendance list for our latecomers, so it needs to be signed every day. So please double check that you sign the attendance list. Uh, Thank uh -huh. 